let our praise rise. Get our eyes on Jesus. Is 
you, Almighty God. Just give it all to Him. And all I see is a battle. You see my victory. When all I see is a mountain. You see a mountain move. as I walk as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me there's nothing to fear now for I am safe with you thank you Jesus so when I find I will fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I sing through the night Oh God, battle belongs to you Oh come on, you believe that? laid all of his feet surrender you Jesus it's all yours God defender and healer a fortress Jesus and if you are for me and if you are for me who can be against me There's nothing impossible for you. Trust you, God. And all I see is you see the beauty. And all I see is a cross. Oh, God, you see the empty. Oh, oh, oh. So when I fight, I will fight on my knees With my hand lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you in our praise laid all before you Jesus come on almighty fortress almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our God you shine in the shadow you win every Bound, oh, nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every bound, oh. Stand against the power of our God, Almighty Fortress. For you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow.
this morning, Jesus, the battle belongs to you. You and only you. Declare you to be king, ruler over everything. Come on, it's when I fight, when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Come on, cross this place. Just lay it at his feet. Trust him in the midst of whatever it is. Just cross this place. I invite you just lift your hands to him. Just fight and worship. Allow him to rise above every situation, above every need, above every question. It's the eternal God. Jesus, rise around you. Nothing compares to you. Nothing compares to you. Nothing can challenge our God. There's no one like you, Jesus. of you, God. Long for more of you. And I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to
He's powerful. He's all knowing. He's all loving. There's nothing like him. This world, God. There's no one like him. In this world. God, we can feel you moving things around in our lives, readjusting priorities, bringing clarity, speaking life. This morning, God, we celebrate your love for us. It's where our confidence is, it's not in our abilities, not in our earning anything, but in your love for us, in your grace and in your mercy. We throw our cares on you, put our hope in you, our trust in you, God. And we celebrate, God, that you love us. And you loved us first. So we just simply respond to that love. And God, we ask as your kids that you would meet us in this place, draw us closer to you, God. battle belongs to you. So we surrender control and we trust you. We trust your love. God, we thank you. From the, from the depths of our hearts, God, we thank you and we worship you for it. Now, Jesus, speak to our hearts. We make ourselves available to you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray your prayer this morning, say amen. 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 Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. 
Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord, turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body, strength for your bones. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. The voice that is much clearer than ours, the perspective that is much bigger than ours. So thankful that we have a truth that we can actually follow. There is clarity in the midst of the confusion. In the midst of everyone's opinions, there's an opinion that is above everyone. And so we are looking at the Beatitudes, um, wisdom from Jesus, wisdom from God, and clarity where we can uh, find clarity, even if we're not quite sure what the specific strategy that we should take or the specific direction we should take or the specific, specific action um, we, should, uh, we should pursue. Um, there are things that we can move towards. There are things we can fight for. There's values that can bring clarity to our vision. Amen? And so we're looking at some of these, some of these values, some of this clarity that Jesus gives us. And uh, we've kind of worked through these last few weeks. First week, we were, we were looking at the idea of, just the big idea of vision being based on values, right? Clarity in the midst of confusion, uh, wisdom of Jesus, valuing uh, the first one, the first pair. We've been looking at these beatitudes in pairs. There's eight of them. And so the first two we were looking at were, was paired together became this value of painful poverty, right? Stewards have everything because they have nothing. They've laid it all down and they've taken up their position between the master and the mission. They're there to serve. Uh, all that they have is the master's, right? His glory is shown through our emptiness and our brokenness. And then we were looking at the next two, uh, the idea of valuing a humble hunger. This was last week, humility and hunger, right? Humility being about meekness, not weakness, right? The idea of choosing to lay down. We're, we're not humble because we have no other option. We're not humble because we can't fight. We're humble because we've chosen to submit ourselves. So there's this meekness, not this weakness, but then it's paired with this hunger, this desperate longing for righteousness, for justice, for what should be, to come into alignment with God. And so we thrive as stewards. We thrive when we're put in that that difficult balancing spot between the master and the mission. We're balancing the idea of being a humbly submitted and this hunger for, you know, pursuing, this, this hunger for uh, success in what God has, in what he directs us to. So there's this desperate passion. We give everything that we've got for it, and then we surrender the outcome to him, all right? We lay our lives down, but the outcome is his. So there's this humble hunger that we value in, and as we're moving through this life, right? Uh, one of the things we said last week was we're willing to lose now for now because we know we ultimately win, but we're willing to lose for now if he asks us to. We're not going down without a fight. That was one of the, one of the first versions of it. It's like we're willing to lose, but we don't want to, right? So we can hold on to, and it's not uh, if, if God takes things in another direction, if God allows things to happen, we don't back off and say, well, you know, whatever. I didn't really want it anyway. You know, we, it's okay to hunger for righteousness, to desire and long for and fight for what we feel and what we believe should be, what we feel is in alignment with the character of God, but not in our own strength, not by our own decision, always submitted to the master. All right, so there's this humble hunger. And uh, we kind of left off last week with Micah chapter 6, verse 8. It says, no, O people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. And that takes us into this week. We're starting a, uh, an actual two-parter this week. As we look over these next two, um, the, these, next, uh, these next two Beatitudes, they're going to work together and they're gonna give us two separate values, Okay. And so what we're looking at for the next two, two weeks is the idea of passion and purity. Passion and purity. And they're going to come together and they're going to create uh, this week, our first week, the value that we're going to be looking at is passionate purity. Passionate purity. Okay? Matthew chapter 5, verses uh, 7 and 8. It says, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. 
God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Right? Those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Those who are pure, for they will see God. All right, the idea of, of passion, where we get this idea of, of passion and tying it to um, the concept of mercy, that passionate, um, we understand it as this strong desire, this, you know, this, uh, there's, there's a craving of passion, and there's, it's kind of like this burning fire, and you can apply it to a lot of different things, right? And uh, uh, passion originally, though, uh, it comes, if you go back to this, this original root that we, that we has become over the years, goes back to this Latin root, uh, tying to the idea of suffering, of enduring, of, uh, of continuing on, of it fully experiencing and keeping going, right? We, we know this often tied to the passion of the Christ, right? Passion week, as Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, all right? As, as he was beaten, as he was falsely accused, uh, as he was nailed to the cross, as he died, this is the passion of the Christ. Not just that he really, really wanted something, but he was enduring something heading in a direction. He was pursuing something fully. He was fully experiencing something, moving towards this target, right? This willingness to sacrifice one's life for whatever it is. And that is this idea of passion. This is, this is the passion. It's, it's this suffering and this enduring towards, towards a goal, uh, much like what we were just praying about with the idea of those who have, have served our country in the armed forces. There is, there is a passion image that is there, this willingness to endure, this willingness to suffer. And it's this understanding that we have. This is, this is how we understand what love is. Passion, in, uh, we understand kind of the cheap version of it is I'm really feeling passionate. I love you, right? That's the cheap stuff, right? You go down a little deeper, deeper, and it's this, I am willing to lay my life down. I'm willing to endure. I'm willing to take on. I'm willing to, to, to press through. This is my passion. This is something I'm willing to endure for this. All right, so there's this idea of passion, and then it's paired with this idea of purity. How many of you guys know, uh, speaking of passion, uh, this idea of being passionate, there's a lot of passion, a lot of enduring that is required if you are going to be merciful, right? There is, uh, if you're going to always act in mercy, if you're going to be defined by mercy, you're going to be enduring some passion. You're going to be going through some stuff. And we're going to be focusing more on the passion side of things next week, just a heads up. This week, there's this idea of passionate, but then it's paired with this idea of purity, now, purity, um, this is the idea of single-mindedness, of being fully, basically obsessed, right? To be full of something where there is nothing else there. Many times people, people think of, uh, of purity as an absence of something, which it, which it is true. It's an absence of whatever is, uh, you know, can make it dirty, whatever can um, uh, cloud it, whatever can make it impure, um, can mess it up, can add multiple things, and all of a sudden you don't have what you started with anymore. All right, there's, there's a great skit from the skit guys and uh, where the dad makes his son some brownies, and, and there's only a little poop in it. Just a little bit. And, uh, and this, is one of those, this is one of those great things uh, you, you see at youth camps all the time, the big jug of water and the little moose poop. Bloop. It's only a little bit. It's just, but it becomes... Impure. It's no longer just what it was. Um, in fact, I was actually going to bring out a little casserole dish. And uh, as, a, as a perfect example, uh, actually, I'm holding in my hand right now. Let's talk about brownies. Now that we're talking about brownies, might as well talk about brownies. And, uh, and uh, this right here is a perfectly pure brownie. There is nothing in my hands that should not be in a brownie. That's a pure brownie right there. Yep, no .09 bug parts allowed, right? There's no, there's no impurities, there's no, no nothing. You know, it's just purity by subtraction doesn't work, all right? Purity by addition 
is much more effective. Purity is the idea of being so full of something that there is nothing else there. Okay, it's when you begin to add other things, which is, of course, the idea of subtraction. You want to get rid of the impurities. But if all you're doing is getting rid of stuff, you end up with a vacuum, and it's going to be filled by something. All right, so this idea of purity is more about pursuit than it is about getting rid of stuff. So this idea of purity, single-mindedness, undivided, untainted, I, I don't know, for, for me, I got a little question mark by it, but I think obsessed is this idea of purity. There's just this one desire, one passion, one focus of a heart that drives everything else. It's this idea of purity. Really the idea of integrity, that what you see on the outside matches what is going on in the inside. One person. One unit, not divided, not split, pure. All right, and so to look, I want to take a look at, at three different relationships between this idea of passion and purity, passionate purity. And I want to look at, at these three different things, looking at Psalm chapter 24. We're going to go through this fairly quickly. I mean, in essence, the idea is very, very simple. But I want us to see the, the power of it. Passionate purity. All right, three different things. We're going to look at the passion for purity. We're going to look at the passion and purity. We're going to look at the passion of purity. For and of. Okay, we're just going to tweak it just a little bit and just kind of tilt our heads a little and look at it some different ways, okay? Psalm chapter 24, uh, verses 1 and 2. It says, the, Lord, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas, built it on the ocean depths. Talking about God now. His position, his place, who he is, what he does, and his position within all of creation. All right? Now, if you, if you remember in, uh, uh, in Matthew chapter, in our Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 7 and 8, it says, those who are merciful... They will be shown or they will see mercy. Those who are pure, they will see God. Those who are will see. This idea of, of, uh, of purity, this idea of actually being, right? And so as we look into this, Psalm chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, you've got this image of God who God is, his place as author, as creator, and God's over there. And we want to be with him, right? This is, this is the image of all of humanity. This is, this is us, humanity as a whole. God's over there. We need to be with him. That's it. This is, this is God. Everything revolves around him. Everything depends on him. Everything must attract to him if they are going to attract to life. You're going to experience life. You got to go to God. That's where the life is. He's over there and we're over here. There's this chasm separated. It says your sins have separated you from your God. There's this distance that we have because we haven't treated him like verses one and two. Let's say the earth is the Lord's. Everything in it the world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas, built it on the ocean depths, and there is this passion that we have to be with him. There's this desire. This is what defines purity, is that we are one with God. And this is this passion that we have. The passion for purity is our first passion. Purity. It's, it's above everything that we should be passionate about. At the base of all that is a passion for purity. Over on that wall, passion for presence. First passion. Passion to be with God, to not be separated, to be one with him. This is what's driving us. Purity is about fullness of something, right? Fullness of him. God's over there. We need him. Whatever it takes, this is what humanity is drawn to. This is what we were created for, to be with God, right? And this is our one call to perfection, all right? And this, uh, hopefully this kind of triggers your brain a little bit um, because none of us can be perfect, right? Unless, some of you, unless you figured out something that I haven't or anyone in human history has up to this point. Um, we are 
We can't be perfect. There's, there's no way we can do all that. However, perfection has this idea to it that the true understanding of perfection is not necessarily about checking all the boxes. It's more about completeness, fullness, whole. And so there's this idea of perfection that we are called to. We are called to fullness in him, to fullness at, at the best of our ability to direct our attention to him, to be full of him, to be full in him, to be full in our desire for him. There's this, there is this essence of perfection, this fullness that we are called to and that we can walk in. We can walk in a fullness of desire for him, walk in fullness towards him, walk fully engaged in him. And so there's this passion for purity, this passion to be one with him, this call to wholeness or perfection in him. And so there's this passion for purity, but we can't do that on, on our own. There's also this, the passion and purity. Look at Psalm chapter 24. Uh, the next verse is verse three. Verses three through six says, who may climb or who may seek, uh, who may climb the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy presence? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols, never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing, have a right relationship with God, their savior. Such people may seek you, worship you, in your presence, O God of Jacob. And you see in this, there's actually a little structure in here in verse four that's, that's really cool because there's this question and this was, uh, this was most likely a, this, a call out response between the priest and the people as they're coming into Jerusalem and they're coming into the temple. Right in verse four, only those whose hands and hearts are pure who do not worship idols never tell lies. You look at those words, right? And you have this outward hands whose hands are clean, inward, whose hearts are pure, right? And then it stays inward, right? The uh, do not worship idols, and then it goes outward again, never tells lies. And you have uh, what could be identified as the chiastic structure, this basically a literary bullseye, right? And it goes outward, inward, inward, outward. And usually what's at the center of these bullseyes is what's driving, it's, it's the key point. And so you have this, image of this inward purity, this inward action driving outward action, right? There's clean hands coming from a pure heart. There is uh, truth. There is not telling lies and being driven by worship, embracing truth by, by worship. Those who are, will see. We see this drive from the, the inner person. And this is, that, this is that thing that we are striving for. This is our passion. This is that passion that we will endure whatever it takes. This is our pursuit is to be whole in him, to be pure. There's this passionate pursuit of purity, to be whole in God. Now, just, okay, just take a second. This isn't in my notes, but just take, in a, take a second and consider what it would be like to be holy in his presence be absolutely surrendered to him, to be with him, not holding anything back. Just take a second and just imagine what that would be like, what life there would be there, what confidence there would be there, what, what feeling of wholeness, what answers to so many of the, the, the questions that we have, the peace that would be there the fulfillment of what you were created to be that would be there? Just take a second and think about what it would mean to be in his presence unreservedly, completely, wholly, purely in his presence. All right, so there's this, there's this thing that, he, that, that the psalmist addresses that pulls us back. It's this thing of idols and lies. Right, of things that take the place of God being our one desire, our one pursuit, things that pollute that, and things where we are engaged in something that is not in alignment with reality. And I think these are all over our lives. 
there are tons of things that we have allowed to take the place of God. And there's tons of things that we are even right now believing to be true that simply are not. Whether maybe culture has told us or maybe uh, we just haven't pursued the information or we, we just don't know our Bibles. We don't know what God is telling us and we're, we're listening to other things. Or maybe we just feel like it's wrong. Or we just feel like it should be. There are multiple areas in every single one of us where we are embracing idols and lies. And what it does is it robs us of our purity. It robs us of presence. It robs us of being, which is what we are called for. This is our passion too. He's over there, we're over here. I want to be with him, wholly and completely from the inside to the outside. I don't want my actions just to match what what he says. I want my heart to be with him. I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am walking in step with him. I'm walking heartbeat in a heartbeat with him. That's the passion of purity. All right? But I think there's a lot of areas, and I just want to, uh, you know, John chapter 4, verse 24, many of you know the scripture. It says, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And I think that's what we see in Psalm 24. Worship and truth. Those who do not worship idols and those who do not swear by what is false, those who do not tell lies, those who embrace worshiping the one God and those who embrace the reality that aligns with him. Those who worship in spirit and in truth. Okay? And I just, I just made a quick list. There, these are some areas that and I just want us to make, maybe run through our minds for, for a moment where might idols have crept in? Where might lies have crept in? All right, and there's, there's no way we can do a full system process check while we're sitting here. This is something for, for you guys to just kind of uh, to take home with you. This is something that has plagued me this week. So I thought I'd share it with you, All right? So the idea of idols and lies, how about the area of trust, foundation, confidence? Where is our trust, our foundation, our confidence? Where have we put something other than God into one of those places? Where have we believed a lie about our confidence, about what we should be trusting, about our foundation? How about faith, hope, expectation? What are we expecting that could be a lie? What are we hoping in that could be an idol? Standards, clarity, direction. What standards in our lives have we embraced uh, that have turned into an idol, that have uh, been about a lie that we have believed? Where in our speech are we allowing ourselves to be polluted? Where in our entertainment are we allowing ourselves to be polluted? Where in our relationships, where on Facebook, where on Netflix, where, where in life, where in our finances are we allowing ourselves to be polluted by allowing to be something other than God to be our one pursuit and believing something that is not true? Because wherever that happens, I mean, we can talk about culture, we can talk about... Uh, we, we can talk about uh, changing trends. We can talk about styles. We can talk about personalities. We can talk about all this. Um, but honestly, this is between you and God. This is a purity question. If we are passionate about purity, we will do whatever it takes. We will endure whatever we need to endure to be with him. Just, just, uh, just as a case in point, let's take language for a second. All right, there is a constant shifting in language, constantly. There are words that are common right now that mean nothing, like nothing, their, their, uh, their meaning has no resemblance to what it started out meaning. It's shifted over time. There are words that were massively frowned on earlier that are just commonplace today. There are things that are, that are you know, just today that will be commonplace tomorrow, all right? There are words that you out there as an older generation will never be able to say and feel pure. 
There's, there's words out there today as a younger generation that when your kids hear their friends saying it, it's going to be, it's going to be a non, it's going to be not an issue, but you will never be able to say it and feel pure. All right. There are things that are shifting. Absolutely. Let me challenge you in your personal pursuit of purity, not what is okay for everyone else. What is he asking you to do? And endure it, embrace it. It may, it may be suffering, but this is the passion that is carrying us into purity. And the only way we can do it is because of his passion. The passion of the cross enables the grace for us to come into alignment with him, to experience presence with him, to be covered by his grace. Jesus' passion enables our purity. Jesus' passion enables us to even be able to head out on our own passion. We pursue, we advance, we progress, we become by the grace of God. So the idea of the passion is key in this pursuit of purity. It's going to take, it's going to be costly. Purity always is. But it is going to be so incredibly valuable because those who are will see. Those who are pure will see his presence. I want it. I don't know about you. I want that. I long for for that. And let me tell you, I'm right there with you. It is an incredible struggle to get there. And it will be, I think, for the rest of our lives. Amen? Psalm chapter 51, verses 10 and 11. I just feel like this is kind of the cry of our hearts. It needs to be the cry of our hearts this morning. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I want to be with you. All right? Passion for purity, passion and purity, the passion of purity. Here's the thing. You might want to write this down. If, uh, if your first passion is purity, every other passion will be pure. This is a source concept, a source question. If our first passion is purity, then every other passion that we embrace after that will be pure. And this is the amazing thing because purity is not about removing stuff as much as it is about pursuing something. Okay, and there is a, there is a passion that is there. And if we're talking about aligning with God, the last part of Psalm chapter 24 tells us who this God is. Worship team, I invite you to come up. It says, open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors. Let the king of glory enter. Everybody say glory. Glory. Let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors. Let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the king of glory. The king of glory, the idea of glory, kavod, the idea of weight, of fullness, all of who God is, the king of glory. This is who we are wanting to meet with. This is who we are being, uh, wanting to be with. And if we are with him, does that mean we live in a purely sterile environment and do nothing, touch nothing, don't allow any dust in so we can maintain purity? That doesn't sound like who they're describing. They're describing the king of glory. What is he? Strong and mighty. He is able. He can do whatever he chooses to do. He is invincible in battle. He is always. No one will take him out. And he is backed by heaven's armies. He is awesome. How many of you guys experience peer pressure in junior high? This is the ultimate peer pressure when Jesus shows up with heaven's armies. You going to disagree? This is a very good peer pressure. All the hosts of heaven. He's awesome. 
Our God is awesome. He is awesome in his person. He is awesome in his abilities. He is awesome in his presence. He's just awesome. This is who we are aligning ourselves with. This idea of purity is not, oh, I better not touch it. I might get dirty. It is pursuit. In fact, it is bloody. It is, it is engulfed in battle. It is strong. It's hungry. It's passionate. There is boldness in belonging. When we belong with him, when we are with him, there is boldness that is there. Take you over to Psalm 37. Three of these verses out of this chapter. Psalm 37, four. This is who we are aligning with. This is what we walk in when we are with him. When we are passionate about purity, it says, take delight in the Lord. He will give you your heart's desires. Psalm 37, seven. Be still in the presence of the Lord. Wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Jump ahead to verse 23. It says, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. We are with the King of glory. This is the idea. We are passionate about purity, of being whole with him, not just in our actions, not just in our hearts, but in full alignment, in integrity, being holy and completely his. I was reading, uh, I was doing some uh, study for a, for a class that I'm in on leadership. And I was talking about this leadership principle of difficulty, of, of struggle, of, of uh, engaging in the process and the difficulties that we go through as followers of Jesus. And he was talking about how, cause, cause, I mean, we're gods by creation, right? He owns the patent on us. We are his. But there's this whole different level. And, and what the author was saying was, in through all the struggles, God is constantly trying to make his creation more fully his. To make us who are already his more fully his. This is the idea of purity. As we come, come into this, this, this final moment here, I want us to consider one more time flipping, uh, Psalm chapter 51. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I invite you to stand. Don't banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. To be in his presence, to be with him, that is our desire. That is our passion. And I want to take a few moments before we close. Just give us the opportunity to get our eyes on him, to run to Jesus, to allow him to come back into this place of being that one desire, that one passion. Next week, we're, we're talking about this, this passion, passionate purity. Next week, we're going to be talking about pure passion, all right, and how this flows out. But if your first passion is not purity, you're going to struggle with every other passion because there's going to be impurities that work their way in. So let's make this our first passion, to be wholly his, to be in his presence, to be with him. Let's run to Jesus. Ask him to create a clean heart, right? One more time. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Just let that sink in. So get our eyes on Jesus. is you. We pray like John the Baptist that you become greater we would become less. More of you, less of me, Jesus. I've carried a burden for too long on my 
wasn't created to bear it alone. Hear your invitation to let it all go. And I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that Run to the Father, fall into grace, I'm done with the high, breeze underway. My heart needs a searcher, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father, again and again and again and again. Come on, just run to Jesus. Across this place, I invite you to lift your hands. Just worship him. Lay it all down. Allow him to search your heart. Just run to him. I saw my condition. Had a plan from the start. Your son for redemption. Price for my heart. I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand. I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. So I run to the Father, fall into grace. Searching, my soul needs a prayer, so I run to the Father again and again and again and again, again and again. Run to Jesus again and again. Turn you, run to Jesus, so I run. Run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the high, breeze underway. My heart needs a searching, my soul needs a friend. So I we'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. That's exactly what needs to happen. Again and again. Not just one time. But again and again and again. We run to you, Jesus. God, even if we've known you, pursued you for decades, in this moment, God, we run to you. Declare our need for you. Ask you to clean our hearts. Remove, God, whatever is separating us from you. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Worship you as the king of glory that you are. So, Jesus, we just surrender. Trust you. Declare our need for you. You are so good, God. Your mercy is unending. So we run to you, Jesus. We get ready to leave this, this place, God. We never leave your presence. We never leave your side. Thank you, Jesus, for that confidence. And God, I just pray that you would draw your people into passionate purity. That we would wholly desire, desperately long to be with you. And that we would be among those who would climb the mountain of the Lord, who would see your face, walk in your blessing. Thank you, Jesus. God, thank you for the invitation to walk with you. We want to walk with you, Jesus. 
walk with you, Jesus. So help us as we leave this place to pursue you wholeheartedly. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen.